The ancient past of Bleach has always been a mystery. Despite being the very namesake of the final arc itself, the truth behind what happened a thousand years ago was never revealed in the source material. We pined for it for years, and unfortunately that crucial context was kept a secret right until the very end. We knew that Yamamoto fought Yuhabak a thousand years ago, somehow defeated him, but failed to kill him, and, well, that was about it. Oh, hints were dropped along the way. Sure, the idea that the Zero Division were all intimately familiar with Yu Habak, for example, but never really anything more. It's funny that it's been so many years now, but at long last it seems as though some answers are coming our way. Slowly but surely, the Thousand Year Blood War Arc anime is doing its absolute best to fill in the gaps. That blank thousand year old canvas is gradually being brought to life. As someone who desperately waited for answers, sometimes to questions I didn't even know I had for many years, this, in my opinion, is the single greatest gift the anime can bring to the series. Lore context and, frankly, story, world building. New and extended fights are amazing, don't get me wrong, but they don't mean a lot if we don't understand why they're fighting in the first place beyond a simple Shinigami and Quincy don't like each other very much. Bleach has such a rich lore, so much of it criminally underexplored, and seeing flashbacks like the one in episode 24 of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, Too Early to Win, Too Late to Know, is just so exciting, and it's reignited my desire to dive into the history of Bleach's biggest conflict. The blanks are being filled in piece by piece, the timeline is being written right before our very eyes, and I am so grateful to see it. So, in this video I wanted to piece together everything we know so far about what unfolded a thousand years ago in regards to the direct conflict between Shinigami and Quincy. How did the catalyst for what would eventually become the final arc of Bleach play out. Let's take a look. However, before we get started on the video, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure to do that now for more Bleach content like this every single week. And if you enjoyed the video when you're done with it, make sure to give it a thumbs up as well to help support me and the channel. And if you want to take that support for me another step further, I do have a Patreon as well. If you want to support me over on Patreon, you can get your name in the credits of every video and also get the videos totally ad-free as well. And as always, an enormous shout out and a huge thank you goes out to everyone who is supporting me over on Patreon as I really do appreciate each and every one of you, and I really couldn't do this without you either, so thank you all so, so very much. And yes, there will actually be some spoilers for the Thousand Year Blood War arc of Bleach, some stuff that hasn't yet been animated in episodes to come, so you've been warned. And so, to begin, we actually need to start with the source material, with those chapters that haven't yet been adapted into the anime. Which is, of course, to say I'm sure we'll revisit this in the future once again, when we have hopefully even more insight into the past. I mean, that's partly what's so exciting about all of this. I'm hoping Cores 3 and 4 have even more new material still, as there's plenty of questions left to be answered. Anyway, I'm getting way ahead of myself. Let's turn back the clock and escape into the past. 1,000 years ago, the world of Bleach was a remarkably different place. We'll begin with the Friend Saga that takes place between chapters 631 and 634. That's not a lot of time at all. Realistically, it's too short to even be called a mini-arc in the vein of something like Turn Back the Pendulum or Everything But the Rain, but it was a nice surprise all the same. It also crucially gives us a tantalising, fleeting glimpse into the world of Bleach just over a thousand years ago. In fact, this flashback details one of the oldest time periods we've ever seen in the series. I believe, off the top of my head, only the flashback featuring Yamamoto and Chojiro from chapter 504 is likely to be older, as Chojiro isn't even actively working for Yamamoto yet at that point. Now, of course, there are also some fleeting shots of a younger Yuha Buck found in the arc as well, but those are so nebulous in origin in the first place. What's really cool about the Friends Saga, though, is that we get to see this time period through the lens 
of the human world. And while things might be different in Seoul society a thousand years ago, the iconography is mostly familiar. The human world, on the other hand, is quite different in many ways to how it appears in the present day. While we don't have any concrete dates to go off, we can see from the look and feel of the world that we're in some kind of pseudo-medieval period of history. This unnamed country, broken up into regions, one of which is simply called the Northern Territories, seems to be ruled by lords living in grandiose castles. People travel on horseback and forage and hunt for food using weaponry like bows and arrows, and that's partly why I call it pseudo-medieval, because a lot of the clothing looks far too modern for a thousand years ago. Obviously, the Lichtreich's military uniform in particular stands in stark contrast to the time period, although maybe that's the point. Spanning roughly eight years, this flashback details the build-up to Yuhabak's invasion of Seoul society. Yuhabak himself is just over 200 years old at this point, and no Quincy with his power to share power has been born since. Not until Hashwolf, that is. Yuhabak is a shadowy, mysterious figure, a conqueror, a warlord, who's moving throughout the lands, dominating the settlements through fear and violence. As we see early on, a very young Basby is the son of the lord of that particular region. The Black family even has its own insignia. But Yuhabak torches his family's castle to the ground, presumably killing his parents and unseating them as the rulers of the land. From here, we see the expansion of Yuhabak's Empire of Light. He now controls these people, as we see when his soldiers march on the town to make a declaration carrying Yuhabak's banner and emblem. What's truly fascinating, though, is that since this flashback takes place before the war between Shinigami and Quincy, the Quincy are living out in the open, free of any kind of fear or prejudice. The idea of a Quincy is bandied around so casually that a part of me wonders if everyone here is a Quincy at this point, or at least connected to the Quincy's in some way. For example, Hashwolf and Basby have never met before this scene, yet Hashwolf knows of a Heilig Borgen, and Basby speaks to him as though everyone of their age will be able to make one eventually. Not only that, but seemingly average, everyday villagers seem to know of the existence of Soul Society. At what point was that knowledge lost to time? Obviously, in the present day, the existence of the Soul Society and the Shinigami takes on that of a more traditional afterlife, and your average person doesn't know Shinigami, Hollows, or anything of the spiritual sort even exists at all. Anyway, when we first meet Basby and Hashwolf, we see that Hashwolf is hunting rabbits unsuccessfully for food. Yet Basby, who comes from an aristocratic background, claims he doesn't hunt to eat, because he doesn't need to. Food apparently comes much easier to him, unsurprisingly, so there's also a clear class divide here a thousand years ago as well, as you'd expect. However, when Basby's ancestral castle is burned to the ground, and the forest Hashwolf lived in with his abusive uncle is also razed by Yuhabak, the two join forces. Living off of a few gold coins, they manage to dig out of the ashes of Basby's castle. We don't see the immediate aftermath of Yuhabak's attack on the country. Instead, we skip ahead five years. It seems that is approximately how long it took Yuhabak to truly finish building his empire, as his right-hand man Zedritz claims there are no regions left for them to suppress after that five years. So, at this point in time, the Lichtreich is fully established on Earth. However, as we know, Yuhabak has bigger plans. His strange power enables him to feel and understand the suffering of all souls who die, and he despises the current state of the world, one where the cycle of life and death goes unchallenged. So, Yuhabak prepares his next move. He plans to invade and conquer the Soul Society itself. Taking over and dismantling the actual afterlife feels like a very literal way of trying to put a stop to death, but hey, if he thinks it's going to work for him, more power to him. But Zedritz's shocked expression would imply to me that this sounds like an impossible task. Perhaps the ferocity of the first Gote 13 is already well known by this point. 
But as Yuhabak turns to Zedritz, we can see he currently possesses the Almighty. His eyes split into two irises each. Yuhabak announces his intention to build a brand new combat unit to battle the Gote 13, the Sternritter. Now, I kind of wonder how the Almighty works back here, what kind of limitations it might have, because surely if Yuhabak can at least see the future, he would see the downfall of his empire. But he doesn't seem to act on that, or at the very least to our eyes, he does nothing about it anyway. Unless, of course, the future he was seeing at this point indicated that he would succeed, and that only changes once he loses the Almighty a little later on. Meanwhile, Basby and Hashwath have grown into young adults, still training to eventually bring down Yuhabak the usurper. Basby says something rather interesting here. He mentions that a long time ago, bearing in mind this flashback is already a thousand years old, Quincy's like Hashwalth were born every few decades and weeded out as failures. Since then, for hundreds of years, Quincy's like him simply haven't been born, and it just felt like an old folktale at this point. So, if what Basby is saying is accurate, that means Quincy's with the power to share power used to be a lot more prevalent, but the Quincy race saw that as a weakness and tried to snuff it out. So it seems like from at least as far back as beyond a thousand years into the past, the Quincy's have had an obsession with trying to control, purify, and strengthen their bloodlines. So despite Yuhabak supposedly being the father of the modern-day Quincy, did they really begin with him? Or were there Quincy's with the power to share power before him, since at this point in the story he's only 200 years old? And also, if Yuhabak was born into this world, into this society, then why wasn't he snuffed out in the same way as others that had the same power as him? We really do need more information on the earliest days of the Quincy King. One day, though, Yuhabak's military police ride into a town and declare the formation of the Sternritter, brandishing their new emblem as well. From the nervous looks on the populace's faces, it would appear Yuhabak isn't all that popular, which does make sense since he forcibly took over their land five years earlier. In fact, we see later on that the residents are terrified for Basby's life simply because he dares talk to Hubert himself. Speaking of Hubert, Hubert openly announces to all of the residents that the Sternritter are being formed to invade the Soul Society, and the residents themselves are surprised as Hubert feeds them misinformation, telling them that they believe the Soul Society will attack first if left unchecked. If all of these people here are in fact Quincy's, then perhaps they were forcibly conscripted as Soldat into the army for the invasion, after which many of them would have been wiped out. That perhaps explains to some degree why the world ends up the way it does. However, Yuhabak himself arrives on the scene, pinning the residents of the village to the ground in worship with his spiritual pressure. Yuhabak collects Hashwolf, revealing him as his other half. The Quincy King explains that no Quincy with the same ability as him, the power to share power to others, had been born for 200 years since Yuhabak's birth, but he has been searching for them all this time. It's difficult to pin down exactly what happens next on the timeline. We next see Hashwalth and Basby three years later. By this time, Basby has been newly admitted into the Sternritter, only to find Hashwalth is already their captain. It's hard to know if this scene takes place before or after Ichibei's visit, as we saw in episode 24 of the Thousand Year Blood War anime. A part of me thinks that, with Yuhabak's first Schutzstoffel gathered there at the meeting with Ichibei to defend their king, Presumably Hashwalth would have been there as well if this scene takes place before that meeting. Like I said, it's impossible to know. At the same time, there are some interesting points of speculation to be had as well. If the Sternritter have been bestowed shrifts by Yuhabak since the unit's creation, perhaps that is the unique power that has always separated them from the rest of the Quincy army then that means Leal Barrow is around during this time frame as well, as he's the first Quincy ever to receive a shrift from Yuhabak, and therefore must be the first Sternritter, outside of the likes of Hashwolf, who is an exception, although Hashwolf has a shrift, 
so he received his after Lil Barrow for some reason, which does seem a little bit weird to me. There is of course one other option. There's nothing to say that Hashwalth is the very first Quincy they've picked up to be a part of the Sternritter unit. Hubert and the others may have visited many other villages by this point, announcing the creation of the Sternritter unit and found Lil Barrow there somewhere else, and Yuhabak bestowed him the first shrift. What else is rather interesting, though, is that Hubert is currently the vice captain of the Sternritter, which does also seem surprising to me if it's based purely on power, though admittedly we have no idea how strong Hubert really is. And does he have a shrift? I guess his position could also be based on seniority too, since he's been around since before the idea of the Sternritter was even being made. Either way, whether it's before or after this final scene from the Friend Saga, at some point the Soul Society catches wind of Yuhabak's growing power and influence. As we saw in the newest flashback, Ichibe Hyosabe personally visits the capital building of the Lichtreich to try and propose a non-aggression pact with Yuhabak in order to quash the threat of war before it even begins. As I pointed out, there isn't a trace of ice here in the Lichtreich currently. That must only begin to cover the buildings during the time they spend in the shadows of the Seireite. Although it is weird in the source material in chapter 565, God Like You, we see a silhouetted teenage Yuhabak approaching an ice-covered railing. Anyway, you definitely get the sense that the Soul Society sees itself as an organisation of higher importance than Yuhabak and his empire, they place themselves upon a higher pedestal as they're the ones promising benevolence, so long as Yuhabak does what they say. Ichibei tells Yuhabak that the Quincy's need to leave the balance of the world to them. Presumably this is in regards to their role in killing Hollows, and in return they won't intervene in the consolidation of his empire or his attempts to unify the Quincy race under one banner. As I mentioned in my episode review, the Total unification of the Quincy race is a net bad thing for the Soul Society, especially since they clearly see their race as a threat to the balance of the world, but Ichibe sees fit to make that concession for now. Ichibe tells Yuhabak that as long as he abides by that rule, he's free to sit back and enjoy the fruits of his empire. This is very typical of Ichibe. He's willing to turn a blind eye to whatever suffering Yuhabak is inflicting on humanity, so long as he doesn't upset the balance of the world by endlessly killing hollows. Yuhabak, however, feels he's being deceived. There's more to the balance of the world than Ichibe is letting on. Yuhabak accuses Ichibei of treating him like an ignorant baby, and while Ichibei promises that that wasn't his intention, he also admits that Yuhabak, yes, doesn't really know anything about the world at all. As if to try and prove him wrong, Yuhabak reveals he knows that the world was once one, though how he knows this is unclear. Is it thanks to the Almighty? The Almighty, though, only lets one see into the future, so we definitely need more insight into Yuhabak's younger days, as I mentioned a minute ago. Go. But knowing this, Yuhabak demands to know who split that eternal peace into the three worlds we know today, and in doing so, who brought the fear of death to the masses. Ichibei answers that it was the Soul King, though again, as I mentioned, Ichibei is clearly only telling Yuhabak a half-truth, trying to keep him in the dark as to the involvement of the ancestors of the Shinigami if indeed that is the truth as the anime decides to keep it. Thanks to his innate ability to take back the souls of those he gives power and strength to upon their deaths, Yuhabak understands on an intimate level human pain and torment. He sees and feels the way people fear death and try in vain to cling to their fragile fleeting lives. Yuhabak wishes to know where one can find peace in these three worlds, to which Ichibei says he'll show him. Using the left arm of the Soul King which Ichibei perhaps brought with him in order to preemptively counter Yuhabak's almighty, he shows Yuhabak a glimpse into the real truth, flooding his mind with revelations in an effort to humble him, proving to him that he knew nothing at all. I think Ichibei's reasoning is fairly simple. Basically, he's saying to Yuhabak, 
look, you truly did know nothing about how this world exists and how it works. It exists on a very fragile balance that we and the Soul King maintain, so I implore you to leave it to us, because you don't really know what's actually going on, what's actually at stake here. However, rather than humble him or give him any kind of peace, the truth about what became of the Soul King merely enrages and disgusts you, Habak. It seems that in this moment, Ichibe has plans to kill you, Habak, but the Quincy King sees through it using the Almighty, grabbing Rayo's arm instead. When Yu Habak says that his father's hand is nothing but a sacrifice to his child, he's saying it's his to take. Caught out, Ichibe notes that Yu Habak's eyes are indeed troublesome, but they can't see through the Soul King. And so Ichibe lets Yu Habak take the left arm, watching as it seals his power of the Almighty. As I noted in my review, this is likely due to the Soul King's own absolute version of the Almighty sealing off Yu Habak's own ability. With Yu Habak's power suddenly neutered, Ichibe leaves, warning him that his eyes will never open again until the moment of his death. And I kind of wonder what this means. I speculated in my review that it means the moment Ichibe almost finishes off Yu Habak during their battle that we're about to see in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, which is why Yu Habak's eyes suddenly open in that moment. But actually, I wonder if this moment that Ichibe speaks of, this moment of Yu Habak's death, isn't actually something that happens fairly soon after their meeting the moment he's defeated by Yamamoto. Because we know that Yu Habak has technically had access to the Almighty for some time by his invasion of the Royal Palace, as Hashwalth explains to Uryu that Yu Habak is purposefully keeping his eyes closed until the 999 years of the Kaiser Gesang are up, or else he might accidentally uncontrollably steal the powers of every Sternritter. So if Yu Habak can choose essentially when to activate the Almighty by the time he's fighting Ichibe, then presumably he has had access to it for a while. So I wonder if Yamamoto nearly killing Yu Habak a thousand years ago was the conduit to bring the Almighty back to him. There is also the question of what happened to the left arm. Presumably Yu Habak does dispel it at some point and give it a brand new host, which is how we get Pernod upon Kajaz in the present day. Anyway, that is an awful lot to take in. There is a fair bit of speculation here as well, so let's move on to the final part of what we know about what happened a thousand years ago. Despite Ichibe telling Yu Habak to live a modest life, we know that Yu Habak openly defies him and follows through on his plot to invade the Soul Society nonetheless. Now, however, lacking the ultimate power of the Almighty, Yu Habak gathers his Lichtreich army and marches on Seireite, as we see in episode 7 of the Thousand Year Blood War. At this point, we're now exactly a thousand years from the present day story of Bleach. This battle is the namesake of the final arc itself, and everything else until now has been the catalyst, the spark that lit the fire of war. Based on Robert Akutron's own experience, at some point Yu Habak likely uses the Arles Valen during this battle to empower certain Sternritter by stripping others of their powers and their lives. However, this battle would prove to be a disaster for Yu Habak and his Empire of Light, signalling the end of his cruel reign for the next 999 years to come. Upon invading the Soul Society, Yu Habak and his soldiers are met on the battlefield by the original captains of the Gotei 13. Thirteen vicious, bloodthirsty Shinigami brutish thugs who, according to Yu Habak, were defenders in name only and led by a demon of the sword, Shigakuni Yamamoto, the founder of the Court Guard squad itself. The first Kenpachi and first captain of the 11th Division, Yachiru Unohana, leads the attack, brutally killing Lichtreich Soldat before the other captains follow suit. Without the Almighty to assist him, Yu Habak's forces are decimated in a cataclysmic battle. His original Schutzstoffel, Hubert, Argola and Zedritz are all incinerated by Yamamoto's hellish Bankai, and Yu Habak himself is left standing alone atop a mound of corpses. 
As Yuhabak prepares for his final stand, he's stabbed through the back by Sasakibe Chojuro, enabling Yamamoto to land a decisive strike on the Quincy King. It's, again, difficult to know exactly what happens next. Although Yuhabak somehow isn't killed by Yamamoto, he's seriously injured to the point of retreat. Yuhabak seemingly falls into a slumber, a coma of sorts, as dictated by the Kaiser Gesang, where he must wait 999 years for his pulse, his mind, his strength, and eventually the world to return to being his. These are the areas I feel we need the utmost expansion on. Yuhabak's earliest days as a child, his origins, and the moment and immediate aftermath of his defeat at the hands of Yamamoto. With both of those areas finally filled out, I think we would be really close to being able to piece together the puzzle of Yuhabak for good. But with Yuhabak defeated and his army annihilated, the Lichtreich collapsed. Yuhabak's empire on Earth was vanquished, and presumably the age of the Quincy came to an end. What survivors of the battle there were escaped, fleeing the human world and disappearing into the shadows of Seireite itself, the last place they thought the Shinigami would look for them. There, they used their powers of reishi domination to open pocket dimensions within the darkness, creating a new, separate world for themselves to live in. And for the next 1,000 years, they waited, biding their time. The Lichtreich had fallen, but within the hidden darkness of the shadows of Seireite, the Vandenreich, the invisible empire, rose from the ashes to take its place. The Quincy studied the Shinigami for a millennium, honing their powers and technologies, watching their enemy grow complacent and lazy, all the while waiting for Yuhabak's return. There are plenty of unanswered questions still. How did the Quincy move the capital building of the Lichtreich into the darkness unnoticed? I mean, Silburn definitely seems to be the same castle Yuhabak once had on Earth, unless they just built a new identical version. And how, of course, did Yuhabak survive Yamamoto's attack, and why did he fall into his helpless slumbering state? Was it immediate or was it gradual after he retreated? Which of the Sternritter we see today were around during that first war? Did becoming spirits within the Soul Society help prolong their human lives unnaturally? There is a lot left to learn, and I'm hoping we do, but for now it's great that we're able to put together as comprehensive a history of the conflict a thousand years ago as this, when you consider we had virtually nothing before. Of course, if the anime does give us more, and I'm optimistic it will, I'll update this in the future to paint an even clearer picture of the truth. But what we have so far is a brief look at how Yuhabak conquered the nation that would become his empire of light, as well as how he began to consolidate his power and amass his forces. We see the earliest stages of the creation of the Sternritter, a unit purpose-built to battle the Soul Society, as well as Ichibei's intervention where, as an ambassador of Soul Society, he tried to de-escalate the tense situation. However, Yuhabak called him out and attacked attacked him, resulting in the Quincy's gaining possession of the left arm of Rayo, but also in Yuhabak losing his power of the Almighty. Briefly, if there is one flashback I think we will probably get in the future, it is finding out how the heart of the Soul King came into the Quincy's possession as well. We then finally see Yuhabak's ill-fated assault on the Seireite and his complete and total defeat at the hands of Yamamoto. It's an awesome backstory to a great arc, and I'm looking forward to learning more. But that's it for the video, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it, and I hope it was of some value to you as well, just mapping out everything that happened a thousand years ago, leading up to and including the actual conflict between the Soul Society and the Lichtreich. This is one of my favourite eras of Bleach because it is such a mystery. Every time we learn anything about it, it really helps to illuminate that mysterious past, and I am just so looking forward to hopefully getting even more. But let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Was there anything I missed from this kind of build up to the war and the war itself? I'd love to hear your thoughts on how everything is shaping up. Make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't done already. Give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And until next time, I'll catch you later. And I'll see you then.